Welcome to the Take Up Space Summit. This is a gathering of amazing women leaders who embody the principles of feminine wisdom. We're living in a time when the old ways of dominance just don't cut it anymore. It's time for us to step up and lead with empathy, collaboration, and mutual support. This event is designed to inspire women from all over the world to take up space, to resist and challenge systems that seek to silence or erase our voices, and to do it all with grace and ease. This is your opportunity to honor your power as a woman and to unapologetically elevate every aspect of your life, from your relationships to your career, and to do so with ease and pleasure. So let's celebrate and prioritize the sacred feminine in us and create a beautiful space where we can all thrive together. I'm your host for this event, Irene Chong, and today I'm excited to present Lynn Fraser, who'll be sharing more on developing calm energy for a strong and resilient nervous system. Lynn is a senior teacher in the Himalayan yoga meditation tradition. She is a certified facilitator of the Killaby Inquiries, a somatic mindfulness method of healing. And she's also the founder of the Still Point Method of Healing Trauma. Lynn has been interviewed on major podcasts and summits in her field, such as the Trauma Therapist Podcast, Therapy Chat, Not Another Anxiety Show, and many more. She's also the founder of the Radical Recovery Summit, Innovation in Healing Trauma and Addiction, through a social justice lens. She interviews leaders and innovators in the field, including Gabor Mate, Stephen Porges, Rick Hansen, Resma Menekem, Scott Killaby, and Diane Poolheller. Lynn, I'm so impressed by the work you have done, as well as by the leaders and innovators whom you got to work with. What I love most is your passion in making trauma healing accessible especially at a time when women all over the world are feeling increasingly burnt out and overwhelmed. There's often a shutdown that takes place when we feel that we can't cope, and the result is that there can be a tendency to withdraw and not fully engage with life. Especially in recent years, there's a heightened sense of anxiety and uncertainty, but thankfully, there's also been increasing awareness of the role that trauma in particular developmental trauma, plays in dysregulating our nervous system. With the right knowledge and the right tools, we can come back into a state of balance, feel rested and full, and thereby take up more space in every area of our lives. And this brings me to the first question I'd like to ask you. I know that in your personal process, you underwent a journey of exploring and healing from developmental trauma. I wonder if you could share your story so the audience can get to know you in a more personal and deeper way. And the question is this, what was the greatest challenge in your life when it came to taking up space? To arrive at a place where you truly believed in your value and worth, and how did you overcome this? Thank you, Irene. That's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> and it really involves the whole of my lifespan in many ways. But to refer it back to developmental trauma, I think most of us are are aware that abuse, um, violence, those kinds of things are traumatic for children. And what I didn't realize until the last, you know, 10 or 15 years is how traumatic it is when nobody seems to care about you. So I lived in a home where there was no violence, no addiction, but there was no connection or caring either. My parents were both really shut down and disconnected. And I had some serious, um, something serious happened when I was 12. And I knew that I couldn't go to my parents with it. And so it involved a grade 12 boy, so six years older than I was. And it started me off on a period of being shamed and excluded um, through my whole junior high and high school years. I did a lot of drugs during that time. I drank a lot during that time. And I just felt really desperate. And looking back on it, I can see how that experience of feeling excluded and like I didn't have anybody to turn to, I wasn't really parented, really affected how I went through the rest of my adult life, how vulnerable I was in relationships, and also 
as I moved into my later 20s, I developed a, a real interest in social activism, in particular feminist activism. And that gave me, talking about taking up space, it gave me the space to express myself, to express my anger, to really look into and understand the dynamics. So this was in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, which is a, a different time than now, for sure. But I was I was excited to be able to understand some of the dynamics around sexual abuse and sexual shaming and how that had affected me and how it really shut me down. I really felt like I, I didn't have any worth. And that's what happens with people as I've been learning more about developmental trauma is that we're, if we're not loved or if we're treated as though we're bad, then we're going to internalize that belief that there's something really wrong with me. And that shame and that feeling of I'm not good enough, I need to be perfect in order to be cared about, um, it re especially for women, we're really vulnerable to that. And so we, we could move into our adult life just feeling like there's nothing I can contribute, I don't deserve a good relationship, and we get into all of these really dysfunctional patterns. So over the next, you know, decades, many decades, I gradually worked with healing that. And one of the ways was I started meditating 30 years ago uh, when I was about 40. And then the last 15 years, I've been really working with uh, teaching about trauma, working with my own trauma and the somatic mindfulness uh, method that I use to to help other people as well. So that's kind of a short clip on on that history. Oh, that's beautiful. I mean, thank you for sharing your story with such vulnerability and honesty. Um, I relate very much to your story of feeling dissociated and disconnected, um, especially when you spoke about how there's a lot of shame and feeling excluded. And I feel that mm -hmm. this is something that especially human beings who long for social connection, because we are social beings, uh, mm -hmm. we can end up feeling very fragmented and fractured because we just don't feel okay on the inside. Uh, I also want to say how much I appreciate the courage you took to heal yourself from this trauma and how you're now supporting many to do the same. Now, mm -hmm. I know in a lot of the work that you do, you work on um, loving self, loving the self, having compassionate self-care. And that all comes back to, or it comes around to having a nervous system that is resilient, that can navigate challenges that come in our life with balance and with ease. So I'm wondering if you can say more about what does a resilient nervous system look like? And what is its significance in our daily life? Mm -hmm. So one of the quotes from Gabor Mate is that trauma is not what happens to us, it's what happens inside of us as a result of what happened to us. So if we had had, if I had had somebody who was engaged with me on an honest, really attuned empathy level when I was at 12 years old and through my teen years, the effect of the trauma would not have been as intense or as long lasting. So that's one of the things that we need to recognize. And like you say, we're social beings. We need connection with other people. And one of the things that happens when we're traumatized is that we disconnect from ourselves. So we need to find a way back and who would want to be connected with somebody? Maybe there's a mean inner critic that we have. Um, we have feelings of shame. We have all of those core deficiency beliefs. And what happens in the nervous system is that neuroception is our perception of safety or danger. And our brain has a negativity bias, which makes sense if we look at how our nervous system has evolved. And some of this we share with other mammals and some of this is more human and social and relational but we have to have this this ongoing perception of is my physical body and my emotional body am I safe right now and then we have all the evidence of everything that's ever happened to us and then we take that into account and decide what's my level of safety right now and what's the best thing I can do to protect myself so that's the origin of going into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. 
is our nervous system decides based on all the evidence that what's happening is dangerous and we need to go into a survival mode to to live through the experience so if we think about you know we're out somewhere and we see some somebody who looks threatening and for women that's often a man or a group of men and we know that we live in a society where a lot of the violence against women happens from men so we have these images in our mind and we might have personal experience with that as well we also know that we've been hurt by people uh, we've been hurt socially and relationally as well as physically in other ways and so we have this knowing that that we need to be on the alert so then what happens is we start to get maybe images we might have flashbacks if we've had experiences of that kind of trauma but we also go into this mode of what's going to keep me safe. So the, the first point I want to make around the nervous system is we need accurate neuroception. And then the second one is this is an unconscious process. And we go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn because our nervous system decides that's our best option for survival. So when we have this neuroception of this is dangerous, it's we're always going to jump to the most protective that we can because it's better to be safe than sorry. You know, that's just how our nervous system works. It has a negativity bias. So if I'm looking at, you know, a, a different kind of situation, for instance, I'm in a social situation and I hear a certain tone of voice or a, a look of contempt on someone's face, I'm not going to jump to, okay, well, that one person has this look, but everybody, you know, I've had dozens and hundreds of other interactions that have been safe. It's not where our nervous system goes. The nervous system goes to, this is potentially dangerous. So one of the ways that we work with that is we work with making the neuroception more accurate and, and, re and unwinding some of the messages that we're doing. So when we feel under threat, what do we do? We hold our breath and we get really sh small. We often stop stop moving around um, and we go into uh, flight usually if we can get away from the danger we will and that can also be preemptively like social anxiety well I, I don't feel comfortable going out into that environment what if somebody there um, is angry or flies off the handle or what if somebody there what if I'm excluded or if I feel so uncomfortable and so so that's part of what can happen and then if we if we can't get away from it, we might go into a fight response. So if we're going into a fight response, it might be we get angry and we we're just kind of edgy and brittle and and maybe someone doesn't even mean what we think it means, but we're reading it as a threat. And so then we kind of go off into a into a fight response. And what more often happens with children and what more often happens with women, because we tend to not have as much physical or or social power is that we'll go into a freeze response or a fawn response so freeze response looks like that disconnection we were talking about um, i'm not paying attention anymore um, we can be quite extremely in a freeze response where we're really dissociated and don't we're not even really there a lot of times when we have trouble remembering what happened to us as children is because we were really dissociated the best way for us to protect ourselves we can't move out we can't get a different set of parents when we're children we really just need to find another way to escape and that's one way that we do that as we go into freeze and then we might from there develop habits of okay now i'm always holding my breath because that's what feels safest there's enough evidence there but what happens when we hold our breath is that we're signaling to our nervous system that we're in a high level of danger. So we go into these patterns that happen over years and decades where we're signaling, we're continuing continuing to signal our nervous system that there's some kind of danger here. What we want to do with somatic mindfulness, somatic meaning in the body, is we want to be aware of what is the, what's happening right now what is my neuroception? Am I accurate in my perception of threat? But when I'm in a fight, flight, or freeze response, can I come out of that response into something that's more appropriate? 
we can do that in so many different ways. One of the ways that we can work with neuroception is look around the room and just, you know, to look around the room right now for you and for other people who are listening. Is there anything dangerous that your eyes are seeing? And we look for cues of safety as well. You know, actually, there's nothing dangerous here, but we have this history in our nervous system that might be alarming us. But in actual fact, we can look around the rooms. There's nothing wrong here. Or we might hold our own hands uh, and just kind of feel the warmth and support of our hands or feel, become aware of our feet on the floor and our seat on the chair. So there's ways that we can come back into this moment in time. So a lot of nervous system safety and resilience is about accurate neuroception and being here in this moment. So in this moment, we might have a memory of something that had happened in the past that's that's that was traumatizing, but in this moment, it's not happening. So that's what we're always trying to do in terms of building resilience in our nervous system is to have more accurate perception of threat but then also to really develop the tools that we need to come back into self-regulation. And then the other one of those that I mentioned is fawning. And again, that's um, something that less powerful people do to more powerful people. So women tend to fawn more than men, although men do it sometimes too. And it's a way of trying to get the more powerful person on our side. So if you look at some of the the bullies, whether it's on, on the schoolyard or in the political system, oftentimes people are sucking up to them or fawning to try to get on their side and get into that circle of protection because we we know that those people are dangerous. And it can happen in a you know social setting where we're, you know, kind of fawning to the person with more social power. It certainly happens at work where generally people with more power are treated with get more fawning than people with less power and so there's a lot of social and relational engagement there that's very much affected by whether or not we're in fight flight freeze or fawn and then the the good news about that is that we can regulate our nervous system and not be in any one of those so we'll never regulate our nervous system enough that we never go into one of those because i mean we would be non-responsive if we did that we want to be able to be engaging in the world and we want to be able to be engaging when we're not in a fight flight freeze or fawn response we want to be engaging from calm settled strong confident i can engage with this person i don't have to hide out uh, i can take the risk of of interacting with somebody that's beautiful, Lynn. And you've said so much there. I've been busy taking notes because I want to back <laughs> to some of the points that you made. And I just want to unpack them a little deeper so that mm -hmm. our audience can have a better sense of what you're really talking about here. So the first point I want to come back to is the idea of neuroception. Um, that could potentially mm -hmm. be a new term that some of our audience members are not familiar with. So I know you right. mentioned that neuroception is really the process by which we perceive whether we are in danger, whether we are safe, whether something is life-threatening. And you had mm -hmm. emphasized that it's important to have an accurate neuroception because when someone is traumatized um, and something happens that to, to cause that shift within us, we get easily triggered. I know for me, there was it was hypervigilance. I would hear a mm -hmm. slight sound and it in my head, it would become a loud, violent threat that was heading my way. And so uh, on that issue of coming to having a more accurate neuroception, um, I know you mentioned looking around the room, making sure that you're safe. But I'm just wondering if when, when someone is triggered or activated in a traumatic way, um, and it's hard to remember something like that, what can they do in that very moment to remind themselves that what they are perceiving as threatening or dangerous may not necessarily be the case. Well, there's two, two approaches to that. So one is to build more resilience in your nervous system on an ongoing basis. So it's something like doing a relaxation practice, um, working with the breath, noticing what's going on in my body, so most people have sensations and energy in our body that we're not all that comfortable with. 
And trauma, if we're not able to process it in the time it's happening, we store that trauma in our body and it gets stored as sensations, energies, feelings with associated thoughts and memories. So for instance, if we go into an uneasy feeling in our stomach area, uh, it might be a very familiar feeling and it's associated with all the times when we felt scared. So that's part of the reason why sometimes people have a hard time going into breathing practices because it's uncomfortable to pay attention. If we're breathing diaphragmatically, as we breathe out, our stomach softens. And as we breathe in, then our, our stomach area rises or expands. And so if we have a, a deep core of fear or anxiety in the stomach area, we're not going to want to, number one, pay attention to that. So we our, our neuroception, our unconscious is always paying attention. But our conscious mind, oftentimes we're up in our head somewhere and we're like, well, that's ridiculous. That's not a threat. But that our, our neuroception isn't about listening to thoughts or words. It's about what's happening in our body. So one of the things people can do is to develop the capacity by doing regular relaxation and breathing practices. But then also when something's starting to come up and rising kind of sharply, like you're feeling a bit panicky or there's a big, you know, you hear a sound and you and you jump and you've got that fear response. Uh, some of the breathing practices are really good to reset the system. So box breathing, cyclic sighing, there's a bunch of practices now, uh, four, seven, eight. So box breathing is when you have, you breathe in for four, you hold your breath for four, breathe out for four, hold your breath for four. And all of these, all of these breathing patterns have something in common and it's that they interrupt the freeze response. And so we start to breathe in a different way and that helps to reset our nervous system. And then we can come back into a more accurate look at, well, what's actually happening here? So do you want to, do you want me to just guide people through the cyclic sighing for a moment so that they can see? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful tool that you've highlighted. Um, maybe before we actually do that, I just want to come back to that, to that point you made about the discomfort that we can sometimes feel and how people who have, who have been traumatized can feel discomfort in their bodies. So they, are, they may be resistant to feeling um, sensations in their, into, in their body or even to notice and watch their breath. Um, I really mm -hmm. like the point that you made about how in order to develop greater resilience in our nervous system, we don't have to wait until we're activated or triggered. Right. There is something... Right can do on a daily consistent basis and mm -hmm. what I really love about your work is that you unpack all this in a very gentle soft nurturing way so that when we actually do these practices we feel safe so for example in a situation like this when when let's say audience members are watching uh, a video watching a summit they generally are in a safe place um, mm -hmm. ideally they're not stressed they're able to absorb and take in all the teachings and this is really the perfect time then to learn how to regulate our nervous system so that when the moment arises, when we are triggered or activated, we can come back because we would have developed a familiarity and our bodies would then have gotten used to these practices of watching our sensations or watching our, our breath. So thank you for mm -hmm. pointing that out. And on that mm -hmm. note, uh, yes, I'd love to invite you to take us through this practice on, I think you mentioned cyclic breathing and box breathing. So perhaps just a few minutes uh, where we can have a taste and experience what that might be like to regulate mm -hmm. and come back to a more calm and settled state. Okay, sure. So the, the one that I use most often now, and it's because some recent research has come out from Stanford University and the Huberman Lab and some other researchers, is that cyclic physiological sighing, which we'll go through in a minute, has been more effective in regulating the nervous system than five minutes. So five minutes of day of that has been more effective than meditation, box breathing, and some other things that they studied. And it's a simple practice. The reason, one of the reasons that we wanna do it on an ongoing basis is so that we'll think about it or we'll remember it when we need it. So if you're starting to have a panic attack and you've never done it, it probably won't occur to you to do a practice, but if you're familiar with it, then it probably will. So it's a double inhale through the nose and a long 
slow exhale like you're breathing out through a thin straw. So we breathe in and then again. And then long, slow exhale through the mouth. And as you're doing the exhale, let your face soften, your neck and shoulders, your whole body. And then again, a double inhale. And the exhalation can get quite long with this. So we're not pushing our stomach in towards the end. We're just letting our stomach relax. And then again, a double inhale. One of the things that is being signaled here is that it's safe enough, we're in a safe enough location to breathe deeply and to make a little bit of noise because it makes a bit of noise when we breathe in that double inhale. And then it's safe enough to take our time breathing out. And the nervous system needs about six seconds on the out breath to signal that it's safe to relax, the relaxation response. So something like this can help with that. We could also do that by singing, talking in longer sentences, but just to notice what's the effect on you, Irene, with that breath? How do you feel after doing that breath for just a couple of minutes? Thank you, Lynn. And as you can imagine, because I am interviewing you, there is a bit of nervousness and tension, but just mm -hmm. a few minutes of that breathing, it felt really good especially when I could lengthen my exhale. Um, mm -hmm. I love that prompt you made about just letting our shoulders drop and relax, softening mm -hmm. our face. I know I closed my eyes so that I could turn more inward. And once mm -hmm. I did that, when I took the in-breath, it felt nourishing to me, like I was giving to myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't feel like it was a me mechanical breathing. My thoughts naturally cleared as a result. And so when I did mm -hmm. the breathing, it was as if, yeah, I was, I was expanding that I could then take up space. And right. then when yeah. I exhaled, I could soften and let go and relax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a powerful experience to have in just a couple of minutes. Yeah. And, and that's something that's really reliable. Like when we do that practice, even if we're starting to really panic, you know, we might hold our own hands. We might, you know, do some of the grounding practices, but to do a, an interruption in the breath is a very powerful practice to bring ourselves back into regulation. Yes. And what I also really love about working with the breath is that we can take it with us wherever we go. We don't need any mm -hmm. fancy tools. Um, yes. We can do it as and when, wherever we are, because it's not right. shitty, it's simple, it's subtle. I was just right. thinking that this would be a perfect practice to do when, say, we're commuting to work or when we are going someplace. And mm -hmm. we know that where, whatever it is that we're heading to may cause some slight tension or anxiety. We can already right. start practicing during this cyclic breathing um, to prepare mm -hmm. us and help regulate our yeah. nervous system. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a slight right. question, though, and I'm just curious and wondering, is there a particular reason why with the in-breath, it has to be uh, two in-breaths instead of just one long one. You know, I'm not sure why that's so effective. Um, it might be partly because we have to really open up our chest more to get the second one. Mm -hmm. And and then when we breathe out, we can kind of let that whole thing soften. Um, most people, if you think about if we're in trouble physically and there's a predator, so we need to be very still and we need to not make any noise because we can't afford to be noticed. So if we think about that as a freeze response, it's an extreme form of a freeze response. But what we do then is we get in the habit of this very shallow breath. So we have barely enough oxygen in our system to actually function. So giving us this extra inhale can help us to experience okay, right now I'm, I'm doing something a little bit threatening by breathing in so big, but then I'm relaxing and letting it all soften and letting, so it's a, we need these experiences in our body in order to be aware of, or in order to change our perception of I'm safe right now. 
it's safe enough for me to breathe in deeply, to make a little bit of noise, and then to do that long exhale. So it's all about how the nervous system perceives safety. And breathing is such an important signal. And, you know, when I talked about people holding their breath, a lot of people have a habit of holding their breath. They breathe in and it's like, we can't afford to let it go because who knows if we're going to get another one. And then we breathe out or it's like, we breathe out. It's like, oh, I just can't take anything more in. And we stop, stop breathing. To have a continuous smooth flow of diaphragmatic breath signals safety to the nervous system. To interrupt the breath by holding our breath or breathing very shallow signals danger to the nervous system. That's why it's important to have an ongoing 24-7 continuous smooth diaphragmatic breath. But when we get into some kind of activated state to use one of those practices to, to regulate. And yeah, I use it all the time if I'm in the car. Uh, or if I'm going to be going into a situation where I know it's a bit, a bit anxiety producing, I'll often do that. And then when I'm in this situation, I might not, not be doing that breath because it's a little bit obvious, but I might just be doing deep inhales and then long, slow exhales through the mouth, uh, talking in longer sentences, consciously being aware of my body and my breath. Those are all helpful tools. I appreciate how some of these practices that you've mentioned all bring us back to our body. So for example, with breath, it's about just being aware of our bodies and what's going on with the inhale and with the exhale. Uh, you'd also mm -hmm. mentioned, for example, touching the body. Could you give us a few illustrations of some of the things that we can do? I know that for myself, remembering that I have feet that are solidly rooted and grounded yeah. on the floor so that's yeah. one of the things that I like to do when I'm in an anxious situation. Um, mm -hmm. I'll tell myself to drop out of my head and go all the way right down to my feet. And then mm -hmm. to imagine that I'm being held lovingly by Mother Earth. Um, right. I know that you have more tools. So could you share a couple with us? And maybe we could also try practicing some of them as you take us through. Sure. So there's a bunch that involve the hands. So like you said, just, just kind of patting ourselves down uh, is one way to, oh, I'm actually here in a body. <laughs> that can be helpful. Another one is to give ourselves a hug. So take your right hand under your left armpit and then your left hand on your, your shoulder or on your arm. And you don't have to have a real tight squeeze, although you could, you could just kind of rest with that and notice what that feels like. Take a few breaths. So we're tuning into the comfort we can give ourselves. We're not alone. We have ourselves. We have our adult self here too. And then another one is that's kind of cool is a butterfly hug. So you take your thumbs and hook them together and just kind of pat alternately side to side on your chest. And you can do it quite quickly or slowly or firmly. And see what that does is it connects us with some warmth and pressure in our chest, which is helpful, but it also gives us bilateral brain stimulation. So when we're doing one side or the other, we're stimulating the brain. And that's also very helpful for coming down out of kind of a panicky situation and regulating our nervous system. Um, and the other one, like you said, is be aware just as you're sitting, be aware of your seat and your feet. Um, we can do, you know, a face massage. There's anything we can do that has safe touch is regulating to the nervous system. So that's, those are all helpful. Um, we can also do, uh, so on my website under emergency practices, I have them organized into different areas. So one is touch, one is sight, things like, you know, looking around the room. Uh, one is movement. Um, so we could stand up and do some shaking for a couple of minutes, which is really helpful. That Qigong practice of throwing the energy down into the ground uh, or the shaking the tree. Um, and any kind of movement will help us to come out of a freeze response in particular. So the other thing that happens though, is that if we do, for instance, we're, if we're doing a practice of yoga, we're not really in our bodies because of the uncomfortable sensations there. And then we start tuning into our body and moving our body. We're always looking for this balance of I'm it's safe enough for me to be here, to be here in my body. 
So sometimes when we're doing a yoga practice, we'll, especially if we're doing a lot of heart opening practices or something, we'll have that movement and that feeling, but then we'll start to kind of get a little bit dysregulated because of the intensity of what's stored in our body. So one of the things that's very helpful to work with around the sensations and energy in our body is that it's associated with different times and places. So if we have, um, you know, a feeling of heaviness in the throat or, or, or in the chest or something in the throat, oftentimes people have like a pulsing or a pressure in the throat area where we feel like we can't really breathe. So one of the things we might do then is to bring our attention to the fact that in fact, air is getting through. So even if we have that feeling in our chest or our throat, air is actually getting through. So that's helpful to know. But then also what's going on with that sensation? So is there a memory? What happens if, if something happens to you when you're five or six years old, for instance, and then nothing resolved well with that, you just, you cried yourself to sleep or you figured it out somehow, but you didn't really get any help. Children, especially, and this is part of the developmental trauma piece, is children's brains are not fully developed enough to be able to regulate their own emotional state. We need our adults to be regulated and co-regulate with us. If that didn't happen, or if it didn't happen, we, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if it didn't happen in a safe enough way or good enough way, then as adults, we need to kind of go back and bring that energy forward and find a way to welcome it and to be here with it. And then what happens sometimes is that a memory will come up. Sometimes it's an explicit memory where we remember what actually happened, faces, times, words that were said. It might also be implicit memory, which is we have a felt sense of it, but we don't have the details that we have with explicit memory. But when we're working with explicit memory, um, we might feel some, some sensation in our body and then we have these thoughts come into the mind. And for instance, you might have an image of somebody's face or you might have a sound, you know, the tone of somebody's voice. But one of the tools to use with that is to take the image, whatever it is, and first of all, notice that you're looking at an image. So if you're looking at it out of your own eyes, it seems a lot more real and present moment than if you can take a step back and look at yourself in the picture. So, you know, here you are six years old, you're in the kitchen with your parents or whatever, whatever the circumstance was. So see yourself in the image. Don't look at it out of your own eyes. So that's one, one way. And then take the image with your eyes open and put it on the wall on the other side of the room and notice that there's an image. See if you can put it in a frame. And then notice there's space all around the frame. So what we're doing is we're looking at an image of something that happened. It's related to this sensation or energy that's in the body. And we're looking at this image. So then what do you do? So one of the ways, I mean, you could do some tapping. Just take your attention away from the image and into the sound and sensation of the tapping. But another way is to take your eyes into that empty space. So you have the image, the frame, and then the empty space. And from the top of that space, take your eyes around a couple of times in one direction and then a couple of times in the other direction. Do you want to try it and see? Do you have an image that you could work with? Um, I do. I have a painting right in front of me that you could look at. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So put whatever image, whatever memory it is, put that into that frame and notice that there's an image in the frame then there's the space on the outside. And notice how it feels in your body to look at that image. So if it was a very traumatic image, you're going to have a lot of energy in your body. And regulate your breath. You take a few deep breaths. And then take your eyes around the empty space a couple of times in one direction and a couple of times in the other direction. And then look back into the image when you're finished. Look back into the space in the, inside the frame. And what happened to the image? Is it the same? Has it changed? 
what I find really interesting in this process, Lynn, is that there's almost a conscious dissociation and a disconnection, but it's a healthy mm -hmm. one where I'm not drawn or sucked into the drama, into the drama, mm -hmm. of, but mm -hmm. there's a, a safe distance where I can see outside of the frame and therefore take a step back, um, right. watch my breathing. And yeah. that causes an interrupt, a pattern interrupt, as, as you were mentioning. Right. Yeah. So that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And that can be really, really helpful when we when we start working with the energy and sensation in our body. We need to be able to connect with that because that's the stored trauma. It's stored with the energy, the memories, the thoughts. And at some point when we're working with healing trauma, we need to be able to allow that to be here and be in our awareness. And we don't want to be sucked back into the time when that memory happened. So we always want to be here in this present moment, grounded, oriented. I'm aware that I'm here. I'm aware that I'm witnessing or looking at a memory of something that happened. It's not happening right now. So tapping, putting it in a frame, taking your eye, eyes around the space on the outside. Those are all ways, nonverbal ways to let our nervous system know that's not happening right now. I'm witnessing or seeing a memory of something that happened. And that's what helps us to stay here in this moment. And then we can bring in pieces like when that happened to me at that age, whatever it was, I couldn't really do anything about it. I didn't have the agency to get out of that relationship or get out of that situation. And it's not always at home. It could be a bully at school. It could be all kinds of different things. But now I'm an adult, so I'm in a different situation now. But our nervous system, our neuroception is still based on that moment in time. So at, at that moment in time, we don't have enough agency or power, or even our brain is not developed fully enough to get out of the situation and to, to resolve the traumatic situation and to heal that wound. But as an adult, we do. We, we can be present in our body. We can allow ourselves to connect with kindness and compassion, to look at that young person in that memory, go, wow, what a situation I was in. I was so, I was so hurt and alone and I didn't know what to do. And I just disconnected from myself or I went into a rage or whatever it is that we do. We go into those survival modes. And now as an adult, I can go back and reconnect with that part of me that was scared. And what happens when we do that is those energies in our body start to resolve. So it takes so much effort to suppress the traumatic energy that's stored in our body. And so one of the ways that we heal, um, especially if we're doing the somatic method, is to actually go into our body and feel it, welcome what it is that was stored in that energy, um, let ourselves know that now in this moment, I'm an adult and I can handle being there. And sometimes I'm not at all trying to suggest we should do all of this work on our own. Oftentimes we need some kind of therapeutic or facilitator support um, because we need help to stay in the present moment. And then we start to unpack a lot of those thoughts about ourselves, like the shame. Um, you know, if a child is not loved and protected, the message we start to believe is that we're not worthy of being loved and protected. And it's a, it's incorrect, it's false, but it's deeply conditioned. So then we need to be able to, to bring up some of those, you know, that was my experience. What did I begin to believe about myself because of that experience? And that's where some of the deeper healing really lies. Um, everything that you've just said is so rich I'm just going to summarize so that our audiences can digest the wealth of wisdom that you've just shared with us. And as you were talking and I was reflecting on it, I thought that there were really two parts to what you're saying about um, coming back and having a resilient nervous system so that we can expand and be fully present in the moment. One of which, as you've highlighted, are these somatic practices that we can do when we know that we are entering a tense or anxious situation or when we are 
already in a situation. There are certain tools that we can immediately use in the present moment to help regulate our nervous system. So you highlighted a couple of somatic practices. I know they're my favorite. Um, I recall the instances when I was feeling really nervous and stressed, and I would just take myself out, maybe go into uh, the female toilet, go to a cubicle, and just shake, just shake all that nervous energy and let it dissipate. Mm -hmm. um, I also really love the butterfly hug that you mentioned, because not only am I physically touching myself and soothing myself, but I like to go slow with the in uh, with, with the tapping uh -huh. left and right. And I feel that that actually helps bring down my racing heart. It brings down my right. heart rate. Mm -hmm. And I feel the warmth of my hands come back to a place of self-love and compassion. Mm -hmm. The final thing I like to do is to do some tapping. Um, EFT, which I think you you, are, you you also do with your clients, you know, that that is very soothing in it in and of itself. And it helps me to process some of the mental thoughts that come up. Mm -hmm. So any combination, and I'm, you know, I'm sure you have your favorites. Uh, these are my top three. These are ones that I've actually done myself when I'm in a situation uh, and I want to bring myself back to a more calm and settled state. The other piece that you're talking about, which I, I feel is so important as well, is um, when you mentioned how a lot of these um, triggers have their roots in our childhood. And I know mm -hmm. that uh, in a lot of the work that you do, you also mentioned the adverse, um, is it called adverse childhood? Uh, Experiences, yeah, ACEs. Yeah, yeah ACEs, yeah. in which uh, someone can actually track what experiences they had in childhood and then link that to the current situation, what they're going through. So I know that in a lot of work that I do with my clients, there's a lot of inner child work because as you so rightly pointed out, uh, sometimes we have this, this mean inner critic or we mm -hmm. censor ourselves and we can't get out of these mental loops, what I call trauma loops, because they're so deeply ingrained and conditioned in us. We, mm -hmm. It could be very familiar patterns of maybe it started with an adult figure scolding us or belittling us. And we therefore internalize some of these judgments and we continue yeah. to repeat them to, to ourselves, even as grown adults. So I find that the first step, which can be helpful, is that the somatic work, but then the further exploration that is needed. And um, I know with Gabor Mate, he talks a lot about compassionate inquiry. Uh, mm -hmm. That comes back to what you were saying about um, being kind and gentle, not having a question like, what's wrong with you? Why, why can't you just pull yourself together? But asking and just developing a gentle curiosity well, that's interesting. I found myself so nervous that I couldn't speak or that I found myself stuttering and making um, and making a fool of myself. You know, um, where do I feel it in my body? For me, for example, I say uh, I feel it in my heart, my throat chakra is blocked and my belly is tight. Mm -hmm. Then to find support if you, you don't, if you don't feel able to do it on your own, to then process some of these emotions and talk through them and find ways of processing and resolving a lot of these past wounds and hurts. Because as you so rightly pointed out, we have our adult self. It's all about bringing her online so that she can mm -hmm. take her inner child by the hand and mm -hmm. know and, and assure that our inner child that she is held, that she's safe and that she is supported. Right. Yeah, and on that note, I really like to come back to this piece that you highlighted at the beginning of our uh, interview, which is the mean inner critic. Because you mentioned that mm -hmm. a lot of thoughts can get in the way. And when we are riddled or plagued by thoughts of maybe self-doubt or shame mm -hmm. or even blame, uh, it's hard to remember to be kind to ourselves and to mm -hmm. even come back to these accessible somatic practices because we're too busy and too focused on beating ourselves up. So right. what, what would you suggest to someone who has uh, a strong inner critic? Right. There's, uh, there are a few things. One is to understand where that comes from. So as a child, our best bet for survival is to take the blame ourselves rather than to see the adults or parents to be at fault. 
So we might have a situation where a parent is mentally ill or really stressed by something or just overwhelmed with the what's going on in their life. And they can't really connect with us in a way to um, that's safe enough for us. We feel alone or maybe we're being verbally or otherwise abused. And so we turn against ourselves so that we can maintain the connection with them. And that's a survival level response as well. But then what happens is that as we get older, we're still turning against ourselves and we're still believing some of those core deficiency beliefs. So one of the ways to work with that is to just see, well, why is it that this critic is saying the things that it is? And one of the reasons is to keep us in our place so that we remember we're the bad one, not the other person, which is false. It's not true, but that's the, as a child, that was our best bet for survival. And then if we have a mean inner critic that's always making us play small and not taking up space, we're not taking any risks. So we can protect ourselves into complete safety in our own place, our own home. We're not risking anything. We're not connecting with other people. There's no risk we're going to be excluded or socially ostracized or shamed if we're never connecting with anybody. And so that inner critic can play a role in that as well. There's a, a therapist, Pete Walker, who has a lot of really good information and tools around working with the inner critic. And one of the things he suggests is to argue with it or to anger at the inner critic and just say, no, you don't get to talk to me like that. It's not right what you're saying. No, I'm not accepting that. And then another, and that can be very helpful. And it can take a while because when we think about being a child and being humiliated by a by, a, by an adult, um, we can build up a lot of anger that wasn't safe to express. So we've turned that anger against ourselves and that's a lot of what gives the fuel to the inner critic. So we it can take a little while to do that kind of angering work, but then to come back in. And one of the practices I sometimes have people do is if you, if you were to think about another child, so if we're talking about that six-year-old child again, if you thought about another six-year-old child, number one, what is their brain development? What do they understand? What kind of agency do they have in the world? And we might blame ourselves for something that we did as a survival mechanism when we were young. And it's not appropriate to blame ourselves for that. But because of this mechanism of turning against ourselves, Sometimes it can open space up a little bit by thinking about, well, what about another person? You know, what about if I have a child that age? I know that child. I know they don't have the capacity. For me, when I was uh, my grand, one of my grandchildren turned 12, it was very helpful for me to look at her and go, okay, that's a 12 year old. And what happened to me when I was 12? There's no way I could have managed that or handled it any, any better than what I did. And, you know, she has a lot of support and a well-regulated nervous system. And if something bad happened to her, she would talk to her parents. I didn't have that. And so could I let myself really see clearly a 12-year-old child does not have the capacity to deal with something like what happened to me? And that's a really useful, a really useful kind of process to go through is, if I would have compassion for that happening to someone else, and if I would understand what was what were some of the elements of that, I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't shame them. So why am I doing it to myself? And then do cultivate it as a practice of, I could really see it more clearly. I could look at some of the beliefs I formed. Sometimes for women too, we feel like we should have fought back when we were in a situation even though in fact, not fighting back was probably the safest thing to do and might've been what allowed us to even survive. But we have so much shame around, well, I should have fought back. I should have said this, I should have whatever. And so really to understand how these, our perception of threat and the survival response that we go into is unconscious mind. It's not a failing we've made the best assessment we could about the best way to get through the, the trauma. And now that it's in the past, or now that we're looking at working with some of what's stored in our body, we could be more accurate. 
I really have a look at it and go, you know, that's not fair to blame myself for that. I did the best thing that I could and I made it through. And now how can I heal enough so that I'm not so, um, so affected by that trauma anymore? How can I move that into a place of more accuracy and more healing? And then I, then I can go out and, and offer my gifts to the world. And I, I could feel safe enough to go do that thing I've wanted to do, but I have too much social anxiety around it. Or, you know, there's so many things where we need all the kindness and connection that we can get in this world. And, and it's a shame when we are not able to do that because of unhealed trauma. There's a lot of really reliable ways to heal now. And I really believe it's possible for all of us to heal. I've seen it over and over and over in myself and in other people. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear, Lynn, your words of hope here. As you were saying all of this, I couldn't help but reflect on the neuroscience piece around this and how mm -hmm. it's all about coming back into integrity and wholeness. So mm -hmm. for example, when you're talking about fight, flight, freeze or fawn, that's usually the reptilian and limbic parts of our brain that are activated and how it's important to attend to those first. So the somatic practices that you mentioned, regulating our nervous system so that we feel safe. More, more, more calm, more settled. And only then can we bring our prefrontal cortex, which is so often hijacked uh, and yes. again when we're triggered. And that is when we can, we can then begin that process of inner dialogue and compassionate inquiry. Uh, I love what you mentioned about voice dialogue. I found that to be particularly helpful uh, in my personal process and also when taking clients uh, through this work. Um, mm -hmm. That healthy curiosity or that gentle curiosity to wonder what, what is this critic thinking? And also that process of healthy distancing that, oh, this isn't me. This is just one part of me, the mm -hmm. me inner critic that I can develop a relationship with. Let's, yeah. let's explore. Why, why is he or she um, so upset and so angry? And exactly mm -hmm. as you pointed out, a lot of the times when we were young, uh, the inner critic, or in this case, the adult figure who is criticizing us, uh, wants to put us in our place. And when our inner critic does that, it's often to keep us safe and protected. Yes. It, it wants to, you know, in some uh, unhealthy way uh, to keep us safe. And so yeah. when we bring the adult part of ourselves, that pre uh, prefrontal cortex area, and we start doing things like, um, voice dialogue is one. I know that journaling prompts are also very helpful. Um, even that process, that act of writing brings mm -hmm. bring us back to the physical sensation of being in our bodies, slowing mm -hmm. down our thoughts. You know, we're actually holding a tool in our hands and we are, we're feeling the pen or pencil glide through the paper. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's something quite tactile and kinesthetic yeah. about this that can also help regulate our nervous system. Yeah. Once, yeah. once we align all, all three areas and we can come and arrive at a compassionate place, I loved how you, um, you suggested getting us to think if this were a six-year-old child or this, if this was uh, another child or teenager going through the same thing, what would we be thinking? And oftentimes yeah. we find that we're really hard on ourselves and we're blind, yeah. completely blind to that fact. Yeah. Um, but when we imagine or put somebody else in that same in the same situation that we're in, we often arrive at a place of such compassion. We do. Yeah. We're so incredibly mean to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's that alone, if we could just notice that and intervene in that and stop doing that, that would make such a difference. Because we wouldn't hang around with people who are that mean to us. And yet we do it in our own mind. And that's something that we can notice. And you know, when we say things like that to ourselves, our body responds. So one of the ways that we can start to really monitor that is this somatic mindfulness. Oh, I notice right now I'm feeling my my shoulders are tensed up like embracing for a blow. Or I notice right now I have that kind of sick feeling in my stomach. Or I have that pressure in my chest or my throat. What's going on? And then we tune in. We regulate so that it's safe for us to tune in and then we can work with it. And that's what heals the trauma. We need to be able to start noticing what's going on. And then 
if there's an inner critic or if we have core deficiency beliefs, another thing that's really common is catastrophic thinking. We get into this pattern of what if this happens? What if that happens? And I used to be like the queen of catastrophic thinking and I don't do it anymore because I've worked with it so much. So part of it is I've regulated my nervous system to the point where my neuroception is much more accurate. And the other part is I notice when it happens and I stop and I go, no, I'm not going to go down that, that rabbit hole. And if we have a high level threat, we're going to do everything we can to deal with the threat. And one of the ways is that we, well, if this happens, then I'm going to do that. And if that happens, then I'm going to do that. And, you know, if, if, if that person who I love dies, then I'm going to do, and all of that is pretty useless when it comes to actually being present when something like that happens. And most of the time, those things are not going to happen. So we've spent, you know, our whole, our nervous system gets hijacked by this, by this catastrophic worst case scenario thinking. So that's another part to, to really work with and, and, and that putting it in a frame uh, can be, and, and taking our eyes around the outside space or tapping can be very helpful for that too, to bring ourselves back into like, actually, you know, that's not actually happening. This is a, a fear response. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, just to share, I also know catastrophic thinking all too well. It's something that um, I think uh, yeah. my husband and partner gets a lot from me. Like I'll start spiraling down to this negative um, right. Right. spiral of, oh no, if this happens, then the next thing is going to happen and it's going to lead to this. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I've been, then I would then project into the future years ahead, even before anything years ahead. Yeah. changed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm also glad to say that this work, this somatic inquiry work that that you just highlighted, uh, it has it has helped me a lot to the point where Good. now nowadays when I find myself going there, I'm able to watch what's going on, and uh, not and even arrive at a joyful sort of cheeky place that's oh I catch you now we're not doing that anymore, and right. just and that completely shifts everything. It does. We need to bring it up into awareness. It's one of those processes that if it starts to really get a grip on us in the unconscious mind, it really causes so much suffering and it's not necessary and it's not true. But the other thing that happens in our world right now is that we have so many visual images of people who are in danger and our nervous system evolved to, if there was ever an image of some kind of danger, it was immediate. It was 50 feet away or a hundred feet away. It was not around the world away and so our brain literally doesn't know the difference between something that's happening on a screen that's happening somewhere else in the world or something that's happening to us right now so protecting ourselves from too much violent video images can also be helpful in settling the nervous system and one of the ways that we can do that is to read about the news in print or even in still pictures is a little bit better than videos but to understand what is it that's alarming my nervous system? And then how can I intervene in that? So catastrophic thinking is one. And when we look at, you know, violence against women, for instance, it is true. We live in a culture where a lot of women experience sexual violence and other kinds of violence. So we can't pretend it's not true. And we can also be more accurate. It's not likely that it's going to happen to me in this moment in time here. It's, it's something that we can work with lowering the level of activation in our nervous system so, to something that's more accurate. You know, you were talking about all these things about having a mean inner critic and um, needing to have boundaries around this. Uh, one of the things that you talked about earlier was uh, the fawn response. And I find that a lot of women, more, more women than men, uh, go into the fawn response because of the power dynamics that are just, you know, the, the reality of our current world, where women, because they feel threatened, would submit or what I call people pleasing. And that's a challenge that I think a lot of women struggle with um, in wanting to please everybody, wanting to keep the situation happy, comfortable. They would then bend over backwards or give up a part of themselves. I feel that this, yeah. a lot of this comes to, um, it comes out because a woman doesn't know quite how to value her worth and trust that she is 
deserving of taking up space, you know, and right. speaking her mind, speaking her truth, articulating her feelings, um, that it's not rocking the boat, that it's just about being present to what is truthful for her. So my, my question really is, you know, um, if, if you're somebody who has a tendency to go into fawn mode um, because it is just part of your survival instincts, what are some of the things that someone can do to bring her back online to the fact that she is worthy and fully of value and deserving of taking up space? Right, right. I think the first thing is always awareness, to be aware that that's what we're doing and to not shame ourselves for it. So in our culture, women are conditioned to believe that we're not worthy and that the average man has much more to offer than an, even a very exceptional woman. So that's the world that we live in. It's good to know that it's not our fault. And also when we talk about trauma, lots of times we're talking about historical uh, or childhood trauma and trauma around gender oppression is something that's ongoing just the same as systemic racism. There's a lot of things that are systemic and ongoing and part of the power structure of the places where we live. And we're not personally responsible for those. And we can't kind of wish it was different. So, you know, this isn't about kind of building up our self-esteem. This is about more accurate perception of my own value and to really see, okay, when I had those experiences of feeling unloved, I began to believe that I was unlovable and how can I work with that or that I was unworthy of taking up space unless I was perfect. The perfectionism is another way that this, these trauma responses play out. And can we surround ourselves internally with compassion and love, but also with other people who don't just tolerate us, but actually enjoy being around us and and respect us and and who are on our side and when you when you think of a friend who has some good fortune um they say i'm so happy for you uh good for you i'm really glad that this is happening for you you know and that's it's worth doing this healing work for our own happiness but it's also worth doing this because then that tends to be the kind of people that we're attracted to and that are attracted to us and then we we, we're not in these relationships of of being bullied and having to fawn we gradually begin to trust that I don't have to pretend I'm perfect even when we receive love from somebody if it's because we've been fawning or pretending we're something we're not it doesn't feel real and it's not really because we have that feeling of well if they really knew who I am then they wouldn't they wouldn't actually love me or respect me and so being ourselves, being authentically ourselves and having the space to do that in the world that we're in personally, as well as socially and in the wider culture is a big job. And a lot of that depends on how, how much healing we, we do. And if we have a steady, calm nervous system, then we're much able, much more able to take risks and then we find out that, in fact, we can be ourselves and other people are going to enjoy who we are and we don't have to hide out anymore. And and that's a it's a longer process in some ways, but it's not something we have to get perfect before we can uh, enjoy the fruits of that. Every person deserves to be valued for who they are. And that's something we can do for ourselves and for each other. Kindness is the is the key. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lynn. Those are beautiful words. And thank you so much for guiding us through uh, all your practices, that all the practices that you have around regulating our nervous system. Uh, I really hope by giving our viewers a taste of the shift that can happen uh, when we can experience that quick shift in regulating our nervous system, they can have hope that it is possible to navigate life challenges with calm energy and to operate with more ease and joy. Hmm. So I'd love for our audience to know how they can find out more about your work. And I think this will be a perfect time for me to say more about the generous gift that you're offering to all summit attendees. So Lynn is offering two free eBooks. 
The first is titled Friends with Your Mind, How to Stop Torturing Yourself with Your Thoughts. And the second book is called Healing Ordinary Trauma. You can click on the URL on the summit page and sign up for it. Also, the same link will take you to a lot of other free resources. So for example, I know that Lynn, you have a weekly Sunday community class, as well as mm -hmm. self-paced courses that your students can take. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend everyone to check out these amazing resources. And Lynn, is there anything you would like to add about your gift offering? Uh, no, I just, I think there's a, a lot of really wonderful resources and I'd really encourage people to do that ongoing work of of strengthening and resilience and strengthening and resilience in their nervous system because it really pays off and the tools that we have now are wonderful and they really make a difference and if we're doing them a little bit of the time at least we're going to have a stronger nervous system but we're also going to remember oh i'm starting to feel really anxious uh i'm starting to feel really anxious what am i going to do oh i'll do that breathing thing or i'll hold my own hands or I'll do the butterfly hug. And then we come back in into ourselves, which is wonderful. Mm. And I know that uh, our viewers can really benefit from reading the two books that you have uh, if they wish to delve deeper. Uh, we've had mm. an incredible conversation so far. Uh, thank you so much for all the good work that you do for your time and your energy. Thank you for having me on the summit. I really appreciate that opportunity. You're very welcome. My biggest takeaway from everything that you've shared has been that we are not powerless, that mm -hmm. yes, we can choose to stay small and protect ourselves. But if we do that, we also risk, um, we also risk not feeling what it is to be fully alive and to be fully self-expressed. So with the right tools and with, with the right knowledge, and hopefully by watching this summit, uh, our audience will feel empowered and inspired to step up and fully take up space. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Irene. It was lovely getting to talk together.